Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of book review. So as the first book review of 2023, so we're going to be talking about hands-on simulation modeling with Python. And this is in collaboration with Pack Publisher. And if this is the first time you're watching it, how that works is they provide a PDF and they provide a hard copy. I review the book, I review the code, and I gave an honest opinion. In addition to that, there isn't really any monetary incentive. So hopefully this video can serve the best practice for the audience out there and give you guys an unbiased feedback of what I think what this book is about. So with that being said, let's get started. So first things first, let's talk about the author, right? The author's name is Giosep Siaburo. He is a PhD in environmental physics and he has two master degree. And on top of that, he has 20 years of experience using Python, R, and MATLAB. The moment I read his profile, I was like, oh geez, this dude has been using these three common machine learning languages more than I went to school. That's awesome, right? If I ever gonna learn something, I wanna learn something from somebody like that, okay? And then if that doesn't sell a book, which it should, and then on top of that, he's also listed the top 2% scientists by Stanford University in the world. That's an extremely high honor. So when someone like that wrote a book about mathematical simulation. I want to read about it, right? And let me just tell you guys this. This is an honest opinion from personal experience. Mathematical simulation is extremely important when it comes to understanding theoretical stuff. And then on top of that, it's what's allowing you to bridge the gap from mathematical equation to reality, okay? And that's extremely important because end of the day, we don't want to just draw an equation on a whiteboard and fingers crossed, hopefully we can prove this thing and we have a conclusion based on whatever premise that this equation is based on. Now, if you can do that, that's great. That will get you to grad school. But in reality, there's a gap between that final theorem to how things work in the industry. So how do you fill that gap, right? You're going to have to do some experiments and you're going to want the experiments to have errors, to have noise so that you know what the repercussions is and you know how to handle them. So we're really talking about using computer to create these simulations so that you are aware of these caveats, these gotcha scenarios when you bring the theory to real life. So that's what's important about this book. And based on my review, I think this author has done that job, without a doubt. So if you read the book, they start the first chapter by talking about decision making. And that kind of already is reassuring what I'm talking about in the beginning of this video. So immediately the first thing to talk about is discrete event simulation. And then moving forward from there, second chapter, we immediately start dealing with randomness. What is noise? What is bias? What does randomness come from, right? If they do come from somewhere, how do we understand it? And more importantly, how do we create simulation so that we know what could happen in the future shall this event be repeated. That's something important, right? Specifically in machine learning models such as neural networks, they may or may not give you the exact same answer, right? The answers may not be unique. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem we have to solve. And how do you solve that problem? Simulation. How do you deal with randomness? So then starting from there, you might be thinking about randomness as some sort of probability distribution, right? Like for instance, a normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve. There's indeed a center, there's some sort of variation. But even if I know the center, it doesn't necessarily mean that every time I draw a dot from that distribution, I'm going to hit the center, right? And even if you want to simplify the scenario easier than that, you can talk about coin toss. And if you toss a coin for 10 times, is it going to absolutely hit 0.5? assuming that it can only be heads and tail, and assuming that it's a fair coin? Well, the answer is probably not, right? If you toss a coin for 10 times, you might get seven times head. That's probably true. Does that mean the coin is unfair or not? So all these are great questions. And all these questions can be solved using probability theory. So leading from chapter one and two, what this book is also contributing on the table is a list of probability distributions that's there to cover all the grounds to make sure you have the technicality and the math and the appropriate language to move forward 
from layman's term. And what that's doing for you is it gives you an efficient way of describing a situation without too many words. So instead of saying a bell-shaped curve with a center, with a variation, I could say normal distribution. And I could say, hey, the noise of this data follows normal distribution. And I should really explain all the things that you need to know. And then from there, that wraps up part one of this book and immediately goes to part two, and which is really the meat of this book, because we're talking about a variety of simulation algorithms. Monte Carlo simulation, central limit theorem, law of large numbers, sensitive analysis, Markov decisions, and so on and so forth. I won't bore you with a list of topics. You gotta read the book, right? But I do want to talk about my personal experience with Monte Carlo simulation, and hopefully that could give you the lesson that I wish I had in the beginning of my career. So when I look at Monte Carlo simulation, I actually learned from two sources. One is from business school, and the other is from the stats department. So a little bit finance, a little bit statistics. But both places just show me, hey, you got some sort of stock price, right? And then you can project into the future according to some sort of prior distribution that's known to mankind, that's based on the best experts out there, and then it fans out, okay? You have one dot, a point estimate, and then it fans out, and it covers a range of areas. So I first look at this topic, I didn't really find myself falling in love with what's going on with this situation here and, and why we can gain the best insight. Because think about it, of course, you have a range that you cover based on a simulation. It's kind of obvious that you go up too far, the likelihood of that event happen is small. In the middle, obviously large, and in the bottom, obviously small again. Kind of just like a normal distribution. What's new to learn, right? So that's where things get interesting, because both places have not bring Monte Carlo simulation to its full capacity, which leads to the next concept called Monte Carlo tree search. And for those of you who are in AI, AlphaGo actually adopted that philosophy. So Monte Carlo tree search is essentially a Monte Carlo simulation, but in different generations, or sometimes people call it different stages, but really it's the same philosophy here. What that means is we don't just generate one set of Monte Carlo simulation and fingers crossed, hope that's the best case. No, we don't do that. We create events in different stages. Every stage we have one or sometimes even many Monte Carlo simulation repeated, and we look for the best case scenario that fit the data the best at that stage. And then every stage we iteratively repeat the same process until the error gets less and less. And if that's the case, and if history repeats itself, then guess what? Somewhere, sometime in the future, when this model is well-trained, it will be able to tell if the stock price is going up or down. So that's really the idea here. And of course, there's always caveat situation, right? Because sometimes history repeats itself, sometimes it doesn't. The scenarios where it doesn't, obviously you don't have to worry about that. You can't predict that anyway. But the scenarios that it does, the simulation is able to solve that problem for you. And that's without machine learning, just simply by simulation. So it's really a powerful tool. And one good thing is that this book is able to deliver that insight for you on the table without a question. So that's kind of like a high level of what I want to cover about this book. Now let's jump into code. So the good thing about Pat Publisher is every title, every book that they release, there's also a complimentary GitHub repo. So what that means is anybody can go online, copy the GitHub repo, run the code by yourself. So the rest of this video, we're going to be doing this small simulation. So this particular small simulation we're going to do is called simulation of pi. Now we have all heard of pi, right? It's 3.14. That's the value that you use to compute the area of a circle. Let's break down this idea before we look at the code. So the idea is simple. If the radius of a circle is r, then the area of that circle is pi r squared. So on a unit circle, if the radius is 1, then it's just pi because anything times one is that thing by itself. So that's the breaking point, right? We use that pi as a reference point and we simulate a bunch of dots, okay? So what that means is if the entire area of a circle is pi, then a the quarter of that circle is just gonna be divided by four. So it's pi over four. Then that quarter of a circle, since the radius is one, then guess what? 
it falls on the unit square, meaning that you have a square that all sides are one. And with that being said, you can just throw dots on there, right? You can throw n dots that you measure that's underneath the circle area out of the total of n dots that you throw on the unit square. And you can color code them in different colors, right? The ones that are within the circle area, it's one type of color, and outside of the circle area is another type of color. So with that being said, you can reverse engineer the formula. How that works is you can simply count the ratio, right? If there are a total of n dots that you throw at the unit square, m of them fall inside of the quarter of a unit circle, then the ratio of m over n should be the area of a quarter circle, which is exactly pi over 4, which gives you this formula. Pi over 4 equals to m over n. And if I give you this formula, I give you m, I give you n, you have all the numbers that you need. You can reverse engineer what pi is by simply taking 4 times m divided by n. And that's the equation that we're taking advantage of. So next thing you do is code that up, right? Here I got a code for you, it's directly from GitHub. You can go online and read it by yourself. But basically we're simulating 10,000 data points and we're measuring m of them that's inside of the circle. Obviously there's gonna be a condition here in the for loop whenever I'm throwing that point on the unit square, if it falls inside of this x squared plus y squared kind of region that's gonna be inside of the quarter circle area, then we color code them in different color. And of course, we start counting m to one, to two, to three, to four, and so on and so forth. And then you plot it out, it looks something like this, right? Let's zoom in. So here, I got a quarter circle that's measured by the red line, and I got a bunch of dots shooting onto the unit square, the dots that's inside of this quarter circle, which is this red line, that's green color, outside it's blue color. You compute the ratio m over n, and boom, you can reverse engineer the value of pi. In this case, it's 3.13. So you can kind of say it's kind of similar to the theoretical value of 3.14 that we all know of. But here's a caveat. What if I change the sample size to a rather small number? Let's say only 100 dots. I run this code, it will look like this. And guess what? This number is not that close to 3.14. And that kind of makes sense because you only have 100 dots. And if I change to even smaller number, let's say 50, then you can assume that the numbers are even far off. And then you can change it to 10, then of course it's going to be even further away. So that kind of gives you an idea that that's basically saying, hey, look, if you just shoot a couple of dots and you follow this principle, maybe you're going to get some sort of estimate, but it's nowhere near close to the theoretical value. But what we can do is we can increase this to 100. We run it, you'll probably get closer and increase to 1,000, run again, you'll probably get closer and so on and so forth. You get the idea. I can increase n to a sufficiently large number and you're going to get 3.14. So that principle comes from law of large number. So with that being said, hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope that the content of this video can serve as a good purpose for you to understand on a high level what this book is about. And if you like the video, give a like and hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.